Can we start? Yeah. Okay. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you very much for, for joining, joining this uh, breakout panel. Uh, we are, the, the, the topic of uh, conversation today is rising to the challenge, discrimination and structural inequality. Um, I do hope that uh, it's, it's informative and that there are lots of questions. Please, let's try. I know that these can be quite sort of, uh, you know, formal, but let's try and keep it as informal as we can. Ask, feel free to ask questions um, after all the panellists have, have spoken. Um, so uh, my name is Mariana Masters and I'm your chair. Uh, this is a hybrid event. So I extend a warm welcome to everyone that's tuning in uh, virtually, as well as, as uh, everyone that's in the room. Um, I'm really delighted to uh, be joined by a panel of, of uh, really uh, inspirational trailblazing women. Um, and uh, this event is is actually been uh, a sort of takeover from uh, the Fabian's Women's Network. So I noticed many wonderful Fabian uh, women colleagues in the room. Um, so before I, I begin, uh, I would ask that uh, feel free to publicize this event so you can use uh, the um, at Fabian Women uh, on Twitter and uh, please use also the, the, the general um, hashtag uh, FabNY2020 uh, when, you, when you're actually tweeting. Uh, so as I mentioned, the topic is challenge, um, right, rising to the challenge, discrimination and structural inequality. And first up, we have Councillor Shaista Aziz. And uh, Councillor Aziz is a successful journalist, a comedian, writer, and Labour councillor of Oxford City Council, where she holds the position of Cabinet Member for Inclusive Communities. Um, Shaista, and together with her friends, um, are known as the Three hijab, um, Hijabis. And they started an online petition calling for racists to be banned from all football matches. A uh, really successful uh, campaign uh, that within 24 hours had over a million signatures. Uh, so we really are blessed to have uh, just uh, somebody that doesn't really have en enough superlatives to describe her. So over to you. <laughs> Hi. One, I hope you can hear me. Um, first of all, it's great to see many of you in person. I forgot what that felt like. So it's very lovely to be here with you all. Um, and also to be on this panel with brilliant women here. And thanks for your great introduction as well, Mariana. So I think more than any other time, the issue of structural inequalities has become very, very mainstream. Primarily, this is because of the COVID pandemic, which we're currently still in. As we know, we haven't come out of that pan pandemic. But the level of inequalities up and down the country um, in our communities is, you know, is so visible like never before. And it's really now impossible, I think, for anyone who is serious about uh, making political change in this country to ignore these inequalities. The tragedy is that the UK is one of the most unequal countries in Europe, second only to Estonia, which is quite staggering given the size of this country and given the economic might of this country over many decades. I find this not only to be truly devastating, but also to be very, very shameful. And over the past 20 years, um, increase, there's only been um, equalities of any being, inequalities have only been going in one direction, which is they've just been going upwards. Um, and that trajectory doesn't look like it's going to change anytime soon. At the same time, we've had a massive onslaught on uh, public sector pay. We've got stagnant wages. We've got nurses working around the clock and then still ending up in food banks. Um, I'm a governor of a local primary school in my city. I'm sure many of you are involved in schools either as parents or carers or governors as well. And we run um, uh, breakfast clubs for children. And when I was going to school, that wasn't happening. Um, and why is it happening now all these years on? Um, I think some of the challenges, I want to focus more on the challenges actually, and what I think 
uh, present some ideas about what I think we as Labour should be doing as Labour members, as councillors, as cabinet members, as people who believe in justice and who are desperate to remove this Tory government and make sure that we have a, a, a Labour government ASAP. So I think the challenges are really vast for the Labour movement, and one of them is the way we tell our stories and the way we acknowledge people's stories. So in your introduction, Mariana, you talked about the three hijabis. So if I start from there, and then I'll go backwards a little bit. So I'm sure all of us are aware that last summer there was a football tournament, the Euro final, the finals took place in our country, and our magnificent England team got to the final, and what followed was utterly horrific disgraceful levels of racist abuse being hurled at three young black England players, supposedly for missing a penalty. Um, so my friends and I, uh, one of whom, Amna Abdul Latif, is a councillor in Manchester, and Huda Jawad, who is also um, a Labour Party member, we decided that we weren't going to tolerate this. We're big football fans, so we set up a, a petition the morning after the final. So Monday morning around about 9am, we'd finalise a text for a petition. The petition was calling on um, the government and tech companies and everybody in football to work together to ban racist from football matches. Um, this petition took a life of its own. Basically, uh, by 9.30, I did my first media interview. By the, I, was in, I was at Wembley, by the way. Huda doesn't live very far from Wembley Stadium. We got together to watch the match. And um, we went to Wembley to grab breakfast. The entire place was lit, the litter was everywhere. And the, the, the symbolism was so stark. All I could see was lots of black and minoritized cleaners outside Wembley Stadium cleaning the crap up and lots of broadcasters all of whom were overwhelmingly white broadcasting to the world pictures from Wembley Stadium because this has become a big story so our petition went live around about 9.30, 9 o'clock, 9.30 ish, and then it took a life of its own. By the time I got back to Oxford early afternoon my phone was ringing non-stop and um, within 24 hours we uh, were just getting hundreds and thousands of signatures by uh, by 48 hours, we had Boris Johnson standing uh, in Parliament uh, in Prime, Prime Minister's questions, um, saying that he was committed to banning races from football. Now, why did this happen and how did this happen? This happened because we were not willing to be passive observers uh, watching uh, three young black men being uh, attacked in this way, in this grotesque way. We also know that the, the background for that attack to take place is because of the political narrative in this country and the so-called culture wars that this government is extremely uh, fond of. Um, and all, everything that came before that final allowed what happened at that final to take place. It was absolutely shameful. And millions of people like people like your good selves, were horrified, but they didn't know what to do. And what we did as three visible women of colour, three Muslim women who wear hijab, um, and also two, two of whom, uh, one, is, um, one came to this country, Amna arrived in this country um, when she was about 12 from Libya, her mum's English, she's Libyan, and Huda arrived as a refugee from Iraq. Um, so we told our stories, and I'm, I'm the proud daughter of working class Pakistani migrants. We told our stories, and we connected our stories to those three young black England players and we basically made it very clear that we were not willing to tolerate this and currently we've got 1.2 million signatures we've had two meetings with the FA which were very problematic meetings I'd like to add we've had meetings with politicians um, and we've also started focusing on cricket as well because we know um, at the tail end of last year Azim Rafiq very bravely um, went to parliament and spoke in very clear terms about the Islamophobia, about the racism that he's facing. Now, the thing is, we should not expect minorities and victims of racism to have to keep telling their stories for change to take place. But the, the point I wanna make here is, as a labor movement, what is our story? What is our narrative? You know, the right know what their story and what their narrative is. They claim that equality is about tearing down statues and uh, vandalizing history. Well, we know that's not true. We know that actually denying people's history, denying the multiracial history of this country is a disgrace. 
Um, and why is why why are they so invested in ensuring that our school teachers, for example, cannot teach from a curriculum that is fit for purpose and that allows our children to understand who they are and what this country is and for them to be proud about that. So we decided to tell our stories and, you know, it's quite a brave thing to do, given the state of what's going on in this country. But by telling our stories, we received such a huge outpouring of solidarity from so many different people from all walks of life. And I believe that this is what the labor movement needs to be doing, the trade unions in particular. I believe that we have a story that is just a singular story and no singular story can represent all of us. And a singular story actually becomes a stereotype and it becomes very dangerous to keep endorsing the singular story. So I'm going to give you an example. The Labour Party keeps talking about the working class. Who are the working class? How have the, how are, how have the working classes changed over many decades? And why is it that primarily the working class and politicians love talking about the white working class? Why are they not talking about the multiracial working classes? Why are we not talking about all of us? Why are we just talking about some of us? And I think it's really essential for us as Labour Party members to work more closely with our European counterparts as well to start learning how to tell the story of our country. And like I said, there's not actually a story, there are stories. And we need to be um, unapologetic about building solidarity. And for me, I am a Labour Party member, I'm a councillor, and I'm also a cabinet member in Oxford, but I want the Labour Party to be much braver and much bolder in standing up for what is right. I want the Labour Party to be loudly and unapologetically anti-racist. I want it to own its racist past. I want it to start doing the work to unravel its racist past and to accept that, that right now we are not actually really there at the moment, but we can be. Um, the Black Lives Matters movement, um, you know, has been phenomenal. The pushback against it has also been phenomenal. And we're in a very dangerous situation right now in our country. We have been for a long time, but we're in a really dangerous situation where anytime anyone stands up to talk about equality, there is a wall of noise that hits them. Um, and the issues that we need to focus on are actually um, derailed. And this is part of what racism looks like. So we need to be alert to that. And I think one of the ways we start doing this is by actually really challenging ourselves to have uncomfortable conversations. And this may seem like quite a meek thing to do given what we're up against, but it's not. It's by us having these conversations and, and in our CLPs, in our ward meetings, in our, in our um, council chambers, we need to start having these conversations that then need to lead to action. And I'm just gonna wrap up a little bit just by talking a bit about what's going on in Oxford. So um, in Oxford, um, around three years ago, the council passed a motion calling on Oxford uh, to become an anti-racist city. We are nowhere near making Oxford an anti-racist city, but we are on the journey of doing so. Um, that motion was passed by all parties in the chamber. And uh, there's a whole uh, number of things that the, that the motion calls on, but one of, it, one, of the, one of the items that the motion focuses on is working more closely with our communities. We have a 33% black and ethnic minority population in Oxford. When people think of Oxford, they don't really think of that. Um, and those voices and those stories are overwhelmingly missing. Why is that? So we need to work harder to ensure that those voices and those, those stories are, are, you know, very much part of the daily reality of um, the Oxford uh, Labour run City Council. Um, we all know, as I said, we're, we're, we're still in a pandemic. Uh, we are one of the first uh, cities in the country to set up a number of hubs in our community centers that worked around the clock to support people and communities. And we feel very proud of that, as Annalisa just indicated, I think. Um, now, the thing is, um, for, for far too long, the o Oxford City Council has not had the level of close proximity that it should have to our communities. There are many barriers for uh, minoritized, marginalized communities, particularly racialized communities to come forward and interact with the council and the onus is on us to make that change. Last year for the first time um, the city council elected, um, well I should say the Labour group elected three women of colour onto our cabinet. Uh, this is the first time that's ever happened and this is because representation matters. So it's very possible for us to move things forward and we are moving things forward I believe as a Labour movement but we are going to have to be far braver and far bolder because I'll finish on this one point it's not the same old Tories 
There is nothing normal about this administration that is in power. Mm. We have a Trumpian government in power. We have a Trumpian prime minister tearing up all the rules, making a mockery of democracy. I'm one of the founders of the Stop Trump campaign. We are the people that came together to mobilize millions of people on the streets of London and across the country. And you know, the, the Americans worked very hard our US brothers and sisters worked very hard to remove Trump. The legacy of Trump and the toxicity continues. And we are facing the same battles here. There are a number of dangerous bills that are, you know, are, have gone through uh, the, the, the House and are now at the Lords. Shameful things going on, shameful attacks on refugees, on migrants, on minorities every single day. And it is the job of the Labour movement and the, and the shadow front bench and the, and the you know, everybody's a Labour member, to be at the forefront of fighting this. And so that's my main message. It is that to join up the dots, to understand that we must stand in solidarity with each other, but this is going to have to, we're going to have to ratchet up because the other side is ratcheting up their attacks on a daily basis. But I do feel hopeful and I genuinely believe we can do it, which is why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure you agree now that I, I actually undersold her in my intro. There are not enough superlatives. <laughs> um, moving on, uh, we have uh, Councillor Lucy Caldicott. Um, and uh, Lucy is a charity leader and campaigner uh, working to address issues of inequality, uh, injustice and exclusion. She's worked in senior management positions in a range of, uh, across a range of voluntary and private sector organisations over the last 30 years. Uh, since uh, May 2018, she's been a councillor representing the Stockwell Ward in the London Borough of Lambeth, which I might add as a fellow Lambeth councillor is the best borough in the country. Um, um, she's cabinet lead on health and adult social care and through her consultancy Change Out she works with charities and social enterprises to address issues of diversity, inclusion and culture change. Uh, so Lucy you have around five minutes to uh, talk about uh, inequality, structural inequality in the charity sector, uh, the challenges, learnings and progress. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marianne, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Shais, for your inspirational words as ever. So I'm going to focus on the voluntary sector. I'm not going to focus on my role as a politician, although there are some sort of interplays between the two. And I often think the voluntary sector has some parallels with the Labour Party. And I roll my eyes quite frequently, as you, as you will have often seen. I started working in the voluntary sector around 25 years ago. And I've always been troubled by how distant those at the leadership levels of charities can be from the people that they're designed to serve. The leadership levels of charities are overwhelmingly white and middle class, overwhelmingly female, in fact, but white, middle class. And if there's a disconnect, in my view, between the work on the ground and the bosses, that's a problem. Things like insisting on flying business class, living in compounds when you work for an international poverty alleviation charity is a problem and these things happen. Flying around the world for regular meetings when you work for an environmental charity is a problem. Not paying the living wage to your staff, many of whom might be vulnerable to the very issues that you're campaigning to address. All of these things go on in the charity sector and it's clearly wrong. Uh, the distance between decision making and the top, at the top of many charities and the experiences of those people that they're designed to serve is, raises some interesting questions. How can decision making remain anchored in the core purpose of organisations? What are the right priorities and who gets to decide? In recent years, the charity sector has grappled with scandals about fundraising practices, safeguarding failures and institutional racism. Just yesterday, a report emerged about ActionAid UK and institutional racism riddled throughout that organisation. Other examples of harm. A couple of years ago, Stacey Dooley famously held up a black baby when she was on a shoot representing Comic Relief. There was a furore that rocked the world. And I, I was working in my consultancy then, and I went to work with Comic, within War Comic Relief, supporting staff and the upset and damage that that, that 
incident caused to those, those um, staff members, many of whom, uh, although London-based, are from diaspora communities, many from the Global South, the, the harm that she had caused, I don't think she even understands the half of it. Um, I'm working with a charity at the moment that is, is grappling with institutional misogyny. And um, also I was interested in, in a, a quote um, I saw from a, a disabled activist um, in response to children in need, which was just a couple of months ago. And I, I'll just read her words. As a disabled person, as the mum to a disabled child, as somebody who believes passionately that disabled people deserve the same right to privacy over their medical information as non-disabled people, I do have a real beef with the way children in need raises this money, so cloaked in pity and trauma. So these are the sorts of things that I set up my consultancy to kind of address because I've been seeing them in my whole, in my whole career. And how Nina, um, that activist I just mentioned, feels about children in need takes us right back to the point I made earlier about how charities can sometimes do harm to the very people that they're trying to help, even while they're trying to help them. And I find myself wondering what the charity sector is even for if our practices and workplaces can be actively doing harm in the name of doing good. And if we think about it, who, who even governs the charity sector? Who rules? The, the, the trustees basically select themselves. They select the chair of the trustees. The trustees, you know, do that themselves. Great. And they're all volunteers, you know, and many of them, you know, choose each other from, from uh, you know, the golf club or what have you. And, and allegedly the charity commission is the oversight body. And I don't know if you've seen recently, the charity commission was hauled up in front of the public affairs committee mm -hmm. for questions about the appointment of a man who had been found um, uh, against in an employment trial tribunal and for, for uh, sharing inappropriate images with junior female members of staff. So, um, so I was asked why, sort of to think a bit about why this actually matters. You know, often in the charity sector, we can be a bit woe is me, oh poor us, cap in hand, you know, um, obviously having done all these terrible things. The, import, the voluntary sector is the engine of innovation in service delivery. And, and we often are contracted by government or by local government to deliver services. It really matters for the most vulnerable people in our society that we're governed well, that we do our services well, that we learn from bad practice in the past and that we, we advance. So what to do? So I thought I'd draw out a couple of examples from um, the work I've been doing. Um, I did some work a couple of years ago with Samaritans and um, they had had a, a big furore in the press. They'd appointed somebody who um, had been found to be a bully in a previous organization as their new chief executive, not a good look for the Samaritans. So they were having a lot of internal um, dilemmas. And I did a lot of really interesting conversations with members of staff and volunteers at Samaritans. And one of the things I thought was really interesting, which I think is an example that's applicable across many charities and even with the Labour Party, is about reconnecting with your radical beginnings. I don't know how many of you know, the Samaritans was founded in 1953 at a time when suicide was illegal. How can suicide be illegal, you might ask? Somebody had attempted suicide um, not long before the founding of Samaritans and, and this uh, poor man, he'd, he'd failed, which is good, he'd failed to kill himself. But then he was in a court of law being prosecuted for suicide. And that led to um, the founding of the Samaritans. And they were, their original uh, branch was in Soho. And this was also a time when homosexual acts between consenting men were illegal. So many of their original callers were gay men. And so the so, so Samaritans, in its very beginnings, was radical. And it it began out of that radical ethos. And I, I often reflect on, you know, no one starts a charity with, with a small idea. You start a charity with a big idea to make big change. But what happens is that power gets institutionalized. You end up having to kind of count out a government for funding and you end up losing those radical roots. So what I always say to my clients when I'm working with them is, what if you're inventing yourselves today in 2022, what would you invent? If you were trying to address, you know, whatever cause it is, what would you invent? Um, and then just another couple of points about how I'm doing on time, but um, I think designing true inclusivity into your, into your workings and the way that your staff experience being at work um, 
at, at your organization is, is really important. Representation, many, many charities. There's a, there's a building in Lambeth called Charity Towers where many mm. charities are housed. It's on the, um, on the river on Albert Embankment. And so all those white dominated charities, mm. they're not representative of, of the UK on a race basis. They're not representative of London and they're certainly not representative of mm. Lambeth. So, uh, so thinking about that and having pathways for talent to reach the top is another thing that I, I um, I talked to one of my colleagues, she's a British Indian um, that I work with often on projects, and she plays a game whenever she sees a charity ad that's full of people of colour, and you'll have seen them, they're there, she goes and has a look at their website and she looks at their trustees and she looks at their leadership yeah, teams and different. sees all the white people. So I just want to, um, and I, I think I'll, you know, um, just pick up on Shaisa's point, it can't just be the role of people of colour to tackle racism. White people have a role to play. In fact, we have a bigger role to play. In fact, we invented racism to justify global slavery. So it is, I often say this to my clients, it is on us to do something about that, which is why I do the work that I do. And I say the things that I say, uh, we need to embed equity in our, in our institution. So back to the Labour Party, there's been a lot of talk today about fairness, and fairness is good, and we all think fairness is what we should strive for, but we also need to go further. We need to go for equity, which means doing different things for different communities. The pandemic has shown how different communities have experienced this terrible time differently. Higher rates of mortality amongst, amongst black and minority ethnic people, um, jobs, you know, job insecurities have experienced differently. So no, no matter what you look at, the pandemic has affected different people differently. So building equity into our solutions absolutely has to be front and, and center. And that's something I would really look to um, people like Annalisa as you're developing policy is to really like remember, put, put equity first and do everything with, with, you know, through a lens of equity to really sort of change things um i think i'll close there fantastic fantastic <laughs> Uh, that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and now I'm I'm really proud to to move to um, Annalise uh, Dodds, our MP here. Um, Annalise is Labour and Cooperative MP, um, and she is the Shadow Secretary for State for Women and Equality. So really well placed to to contribute today, uh, and Chair of the Labour Party. So actually, when we look at structural inequalities. She's actually very well placed as well. <laughs> um, she was previously Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, the first woman to hold this position. So trailblazers, all of us. Um, thank you. Um, she was a member of parliament for Oxford East and, uh, and also previous to that, a member of the European Parliament for South East England. Um, and I hope you don't mind me, me saying, Annalise, that uh, you're a real gem, uh, a supporter of the Fabian's Women's Network which really means a lot to us and you always actively choose to extend the career ladder rather than the, uh, you know kicking it away uh, and helping us women navigate the political uh, world so I'm, I'm really proud to, to, to introduce you thank you you have around 10 minutes <laughs> oh goodness oh, five, I thought, I minutes. That, that's an equality already <laughs> Pleasure, well, thank you ever so much, Mariana. It's such a pleasure to be here with the Fabian Women's Network and with so many friends. I can recognise lots of people in this audience that I've worked with before. Um, there's a very interesting Oxford Lambeth access, I have to say, <laughs> on the panel today. Um, but really looking forward to the discussion that we'll have afterwards. Um, and I think it's an incredibly important one where I would very much agree with what the previous speakers have said. I think in many ways, the mountain we have to climb to try and achieve equality is steeper than it's been for a very, very long time indeed. Uh, we've already talked about the legacy, of course, of the current crisis, something I'll speak about in a moment. But so I think we are in a different situation where we have the political right actively engaged often in trying to sow division amongst people rather than bring them together. Um, so we are in different territory and that's one of, as I said, many reasons why it's so important for us to be having this discussion today. Um, I think 
is critical when we reflect on the value of equality and indeed of equity that we view it as fundamental to another value that keir has been talking a lot about recently, which is respect. And I think far too often, unfortunately, over recent years in our country, we've seen respect being honoured more in the breach than being upheld by the government. For me, respect is fundamentally about not dismissing people's concerns, about being willing to look at issues from their perspective, to stand in their shoes, to take them seriously and to act on people's concerns and time and time and time again we've seen an active process of belittling different groups of trying to trash their concerns rather than seeking to support people um, as was mentioned inequalities have become much more intense during this period i think we all are aware of that lucy rightly drew attention to what's taken place for disabled people during uh, the pandemic. Really incredibly disturbingly, 11 times more likely disabled people to die of COVID than those without registered disabilities. And that phrase of no decisions about us without us, so often being forgotten during this pandemic. And it seems being forgotten even now as the government talks finally of, oops, sorry, of the uh, inquiry that needs to take place. Of course, we also know about the horribly unequal impact of this crisis on black, Asian and ethnic minority people, an impact that was laid very, very bare by Baroness Lawrence's report, An Avoidable Crisis, which was produced for Keir Starmer and the Labour Party. And if anyone hasn't yet had a chance to read it, please do, because it not only sets out the depth of those inequalities, but also the measures, many of the measures that we need to take to face up to them. And of course, we also know this has been a crisis where women very often have had to bear uh, the brunt of the impact. Women have been more likely to be furloughed, but they've also been more likely to ask for furlough and not to receive it. Um, they've been more likely to lose work because they've more often worked in those sectors that have been hit heavily by the crisis. But of course, we know none of this just took place during coronavirus. All of these inequalities had very deep roots, which the other speakers have already referred to. And we've just seen those roots getting deeper and deeper. We already had, of course, a gender pay gap, one which Labour governments were starting to reduce, but one whose rate of reduction slowed and slowed under Conservative governments to the extent that, worryingly, the most recent stats indicate it started to open up again. Unbelievably, it's going to now take, uh, it's, well, it's going to be rather 10 million women who work their whole careers without ever seeing equal pay, many decades before it will be achieved. As I revealed, a couple of weeks ago, we already had appalling inequalities, socioeconomic inequalities for black, Asian and minority ethnic people. But we now have a situation where more than half of all black children are growing up in poverty. And the Conservatives' decisions to slash universal credit back down again, to do nothing about the fuel poverty crisis, and time and again not to act on the ethnicity pay gap is of course only going to make that situation worse. And we've also seen a situation where for many LGBT plus workers, bullying and discrimination in the workplace has become normalized. Now, one in five such workers have, are reporting that they've been the target of uh, negative co uh, conduct from colleagues at work and one in three trans people reporting the same. And as I said, not just have the Conservatives ignored these developments, they've actively sought to stoke up division. I think Scheister has spoke, uh, spoken about this already very powerfully indeed. They've been fixated on what they've called a war on woke, but in doing so, they have been fundamentally out of step with the commitments of the vast majority 
of British people. And I do think that was shown actually in the response to what took place with the England team. They tried to stoke up division and they were slapped back massively by uh, the UK population. Uh, but that behaviour, um, as I said, from the Conservatives continues with, for example, the Sewell report, a report which, as we know, suggested that structural racism no longer exists. How on earth could that be claimed after the last 18 months that we've been through? A government that cuts disability benefits in the wake of this crisis, one that disbands its LGBT advisory board um, and that mothballs the action plan it had promised, and one which promised it would have a women's health strategy, but which instead releases a paltry update, which was barely worth the paper that it was written on, and which says that it's protecting women and girls when women and girls have to go out on the streets time and time and time again, just to ask for rape to be prosecuted in our country, let alone for other measures to be taken. So we have a huge, huge fight to ensure that we right those wrongs. But I do believe we're making the first steps to set out how we will do that in the commitments that we have already made. We've committed to a new Race Equality Act, a strong Race Equality Act, one that will face up to discrimination and to structural inequality at source. We've committed to greater equality in the workplace with the New Deal for working people that Angela Rayner set out at the last conference, one which would ensure that parental leave worked, that it was taken on board by men as well as women, one that would make sure there was flexibility from day one for all workers, one that would stop the uh, inequality between part-time and full-time workers. We'd have fair hate crime laws, stopping the inequality between how different groups are treated with LGBT plus and disabled people not given the same protections that they deserve. We'd reform the Gender Recognition Act, something of course that the Conservatives promised but have not delivered while continuing to support the 2010 Equality Act. And we would radically reform policing. In fact, we've already written the bills to pass to do that and to reform the criminal justice system so we can protect women and girls. And this must be an effort that cuts across the next Labour government. Of course, recently there was a huge celebration of what Harriet Harman achieved in Parliament and outside it when she announced that she was not going to be seeking re-election again. And there was that huge outpouring of support because people remembered what had been achieved previously, how there'd been that whole of government effort, how no department could pretend that women's issues were not for them. Well, we've got to do the same. And I'm convinced we can do the same as we put together our policy programme for government and then as we enact it in the next Labour government. It's why I'm very pleased that I am both the Shadow Secretary of State for Women and Equalities and leading Labour's policy review, because far too often we find that equalities come at the end if they're even remembered at all. Of course, they're not remembered at all by this government because it doesn't do a quality impact assessment. They're not even looking at it at the end of the process, let alone at the beginning. Our policy review will include equality from the very beginning. And I think we've shown that in the way that we're conducting that review so far. But of course, we need to make sure that our party also always acts in a way that lives those values of equality. Again, we have many more changes yet to make. We must make those changes morally. We also, of course, have to make them in the wake of the EHRC report. And it's shameful that it took that report, in fact, to make much of that change happen. But we're on the right road with an independent complaints process, with codes of conduct around different forms of racism, with training on those forms of racism, with totally radically overhaul procedures for sexual harassment within our party and many other changes now being made. There is more to do, but we are on the way. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion to find out about how we can be on that way to that next Labour government together. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to now go to uh, questions and um, I'm going to use my chair's prerogative to ask the first question of Annalise. <laughs> and then I'll take uh, questions, two questions. So we'll take them in threes. Um, so my question is, as a black woman, I'm acutely aware of institutional racism. Um, and, um, you know, I'm glad that Shaista touched on uh, the fact that, you know, we've got to have difficult conversations because many black, black people within the Labour family don't feel valued. And so I'd really like to ask uh, what Labour, the, what the Labour Party is doing to show that equality begins at home. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> was that was that like was that tumbleweed? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um I could, you could ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the jump gentleman. Thank you. Um Adriel Awalia Stretham, just to continue the Lambeth, Lambeth. and Oxford uh, <laughs> oddity. Um so many different aspects uh, in this conversation, I guess we could talk about. And if you'll indulge me, I'm going to speak about one that's very specific. So I work in the offshore wind industry, and we've taken an initiative where we're looking at um, through the, what's called the Investment and Talent Group, looking at diversity and inclusion with regards to gender, but as well as ethnicity. One of the things we've been able to do with gender is analyze what the current situation is because we have the gender pay gap requirements. But what's interesting is that we seem to have made no progress in the discussion around ethnicity pay gaps. And Annalise, apologies, I, I don't know if we've publicly said what our position on this, but it seems like such a low-hanging fruit for Labour to say, why the hell has this not been done yet, and to push hard for it? And another question, uh, lady, any, any lady in, in the, the red at the end? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Maura. I'm a councillor in Durham. Um, I always talk about Durham. Um, but in, I think I'm also the first woman to ever chair our Labour group. Um, but I've not confirmed that fully yet. Um, but in addition to my council duties, I'm also, uh, I've worked full time and I'm a carer for my 91 year old grandmother, who's very unwell at the moment, sadly. Um, and one of the things that really helped me to juggle all of my responsibilities outside of the house, including um, going to the four parish councils in my area, including the one where I'm a parish councillor, and also all of my commitments at County Hall was being able to do hybrid meetings, um, which has really opened up um, being a parish councillor in particular, which is unpaid, to a much more diverse group of people. And it was quite cruelly just taken away arbitrarily last year for no reason. Um, it's really heartbreaking for me when my grandma's really, really sick at night to have to say, I'm sorry, love, I can't stay with you and, and help you through your, you know, your pain and, um, and everything that you're going through because I have to go to a meeting that I could do online, but for the government. So is Labour doing it? Would Labour in government bring that back across the board for all local and public authority meetings? Is there anything that Labour's doing right now in Westminster to open that door back up again? Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, do we want to, do you want to start, Annalise, and then, yes, thank you. <laughs> Great. Th thank you um, very much indeed. Uh, First of all, um, yeah, there is, there's a lot that we need to do to make sure that everyone who shares our labour values feels at home in our party, of course. And there's been quite a lot of quite rapid change over recent months, but of course there's still a lot more that we need to do. So we now have for the first time codes of conduct against different forms of racism, including Islamophobia and anti-black racism and Afrophobia as well. That's been passed quite recently by the National Executive Committee. And of course, also all the work against anti-Semitism. Uh, we also have a, a new independent complaints process. And actually there's quite a number of people in this room who are involved in some of the discussions around setting that up. That's absolutely imperative because wherever racism does raise its head, we need to be able to deal with it far more swiftly than we have in the past. You know, we've got a big backlog of complaints. That's not acceptable. We need everyone to have confidence in the system. And I think the new system that's been brought in is going to be so much more effective than the last one. And my goodness, it certainly needed to be. Um, but we also then need to make sure that we've got substantive representation as well. We need to make sure that we've got, you know, brilliant people like Mariana, so many others. We need to make sure that we've got those leaders. And there is, again, 
I would say, quite a lot of positive work that's going on. We've got now a more diverse uh, future candidates programme than's ever been the case before. We haven't had that many people ever engaged in a candidate development programme under the Labour Party. And it's you know far more diverse and representative of our country than we've seen previously from such initiatives. But you know, we do need that then to feed into us making sure that those people are then uh, those in power within our party. So there is still a huge amount that needs to be done. Um, uh, secondly, around the ethnicity pay gap. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's been Labour policy for some time that we really need to see that being introduced. And it's deeply frustrating that the Conservatives say they want to introduce uh, ethnicity pay gap reporting. Well, they've been consulting on it for many, many months. They've had all of the views back from that consultation. They seem to be just sitting on it. Uh, I raised this very first women and equalities questions in Parliament that I did as a new Shadow Secretary of State. I got a load of waffle and nonsense back, quite frankly. We're going to keep pushing them on it. And we've actually been um, on this, you know, building a lot of links with business, with the trade union movement, with a huge coalition of people who are basically saying we should have had this introduced yesterday. There's no excuse for it. So um, something that we'll continue to push on very hard indeed. And then finally, Laura, um, and first of all, thank you for what you do for your grandmother. I mean, one of such an enormous army in our country of unpaid carers who look after people who need that support and who get so little recognition for it. So thank you for that. And I couldn't agree more with what you said about the just completely, you know, arbitrary, pedantic switching off of that option for different councils to meet in a hybrid manner, which had been so important, been important for people with caring responsibilities, for many people with disabilities who often found that, you know, it fitted in better uh, uh, for them as well. And for lots of people in rural areas as well, you know, if you've got to travel for literally hours to get to uh, a council meeting, for example, then it makes much more sense to be able to do it in a hybrid fashion. Uh, we're going to keep pushing the government on this. You know, at the time we objected very, very strongly and we'll keep saying to them, on this, as on so many other issues, they should just listen to councils. Just listen to what councils are saying. Stop telling them what to do. And this is just one of many examples. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, ladies, would you, would you like to answer one of the questions each? Sure. I'll, do, I'll pick up on the local government point um, and solidarity to you, Laura, for your caring responsibilities. I was going through a similar experience myself a year ago. And, um, and, I, and I just would just kind of build on what Annalisa has said. It, it's sort of shameful, really. The, the, the local authorities have been on the front line of this pandemic. Mm. Everywhere you look, we're responsible for public health. It comes under our purview. And to just disregard us in this way is, is absolutely shameful. So to, to be in the 21st century with hybrid meetings, perfectly feasible, mm. perfectly feasible to be able to do votes online remotely so that people can join if they want to or not join if they don't want to is absolutely possible and I'm glad it's Labour Party policy and it's certainly local government Labour and local government policy as well. Um, Laura just to say uh, first of all thanks for speaking in the way you have and just to send love solidarity to you and your grandma and thanks for what you're doing. Um, so on the, the uh, what Annalise has just said about the Labour Party introducing new systems of course we welcome this but in the history of the world no system has ever changed the world. What changes the world is accountability um, and we need to see greater accountability and transparency from the Labour Party on all the issues that we've been discussing this afternoon and quite frankly a lot of the accountability continues to be missing. Um, I think this issue really feeds also into the question, I'm very sorry I didn't catch your name, about the race pay gap. The race pay gap is absolutely essential and it should be mandatory. Oxford City Council has made uh, uh, the race pay gap a mandatory, which I'm really proud of. Um, it's not actually required to do that by law, but up and down the country, all businesses, all institutions, places of learning, they should have to publish the race pay gap because the race pay gap and the gender pay gap go hand in hand, as does the disability pay gap. This is how intersectionality works. Mm. So we can't just be looking at the gender pay gap alone. And, you know, we know that this government doesn't care about equalities uh, but we need to make sure that we are pushing on this as far as possible but all of these issues that we're talking about intersect brilliant thank you all right we've got three more questions 
So Liz and the gentleman at the back and... Oh, sorry, I couldn't see. Oh, oh, so sorry. Multitasking Mariana. I'm a bit of a Luddite, sorry. Hybrid, oh dear. Fail. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, yes, yes. Okay, I'm trying to um, find... Like, well, I think everyone on the panel knows me and is not going to be surprised by the questions that I'm about to ask. Um, Annalise, you talked about how Angela's paper talked about all workers. Well, of course it doesn't. It misses out millions of working people who happen to not be employed um, because either we're you know, running small businesses or we're genuinely self-employed because bogus self-employment covers 9% of self-employment. So it's, it's a minority problem within self-employment. Um, but gender pay gaps, ethnicity pay gaps, disability pay gaps are wider for the self-employed and the sort of reporting that we're seeing on pay gaps don't cover self-employment. And then, of course, there's a finance pay gap to talk about as well, where, you know, we're seeing a, a gap in finance for businesses of, you know, ethnic minorities, of women, of disabled people, of all exactly the same people that we're talking about. Um, and yes, it's something that I will continually bring up in, in panels like this, because I think, you know, with the excluded UK and the Forgotten Limited, you know, there are so many people in my situation who have realised that the Conservative government don't care about us, that they're too busy setting up their VIP lanes for their mates. Um, and if you look at polling amongst people in my situation, the vast majority used to vote Conservative, but now we're in the don't know category. So there's millions of votes that, you know, how do the left win, win those votes? Um, I'll just actually, I um, do apologize to the people that I, I, forward, I passed them there in the audience. I've got a couple of online questions. Uh, so uh, from Sharna Alexander, she's a great event, thank you. Uh, she's uh, on the Future Candidates Programme and her question is, how can we better support and protect people who are just going into politics, who are targeted for abuse, from jibes about Angela Rayner's accent on social media to the threats to our black female MPs um, that continue to endure. It's a huge barrier for better representation. So, uh, and I have, I'll just ask, um, yeah, that's, that's that's the main main question. So I'll have one last, one, one more question. Um, and I, I did go to the gentleman at the back with a, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. My name is Max and I don't live in Lambeth or Oxford. <gasps> okay. Sorry about that. Um, this is just to pick up on a point that uh, Lucy Caldicott mentioned, which is um, really the concept of allyship. So um, I don't I haven't got the lived experience of being on the end of racist abuse, misogynistic abuse, disabled hate crime and the rest of it. But I want to support people who have. And so I can do that through being an ally. And there's lots of information about how to do that out there. Um, the other thing is about, is about how to actually do that. And one of the key concepts I think with that is being an active bystander. So if I'm in a meeting and somebody makes a comment or acts in a particular way, which makes somebody else feel uncomfortable and it's through discriminatory behavior or language, I have to, I have a responsibility, I think, to actually challenge that. But it's got to be done in a, in a considered way, in a particular way, according to the individual situation. So I think allyship and active bystanders should be something that the Labour Party makes a bit more high profile so that people like me can actually implement these initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask for really quick responses because we're going to be kicked out when we have to be downstairs. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, uh, so, um, so uh, we've had some brilliant questions. Do you want to start yeah. this time? Just one, um, yeah. if you'd answer just one. Yeah. So Charlotte, your question and the gentleman's point there about uh, allyship, I think goes hand in hand. So how do we better protect and support people in politics, particularly minorities and women? Well, it's very straightforward. We have to be better allies. We have to be more vocal in our solidarity and in pushing back. And also we have to create safety in our labor spaces and that's missing. So we need to start there. 
I'll pick up on the point from the from the Zoom, which is about the um, better supporting people go, just going into politics. I mean, partly I think um, uh, campaigning against the online platforms that allow this bigotry and hatred to just swirl around as if it's okay is is a start. And I think the other thing, which is Fabian Women's Network, we our solidarity and our mentoring and our support and our buddying. All of that stuff is we, we're there pulling, you know, pushing the ladder down to bring bring others up. So for entrance into politics, if, if you're female, I'd really recommend the Fabian Women's Network and, and the buddying and sisterhood that we show each other. That's fantastic. That was part of my, my final point. So oh, thank you. <laughs> we're multitasking here. It's Lambeth Tag Team. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I very much agree with, with what's just been said, funnily enough, by, by Shaysta and Lucy about um, uh, countering abuse and allyship more generally. Um, but on, on Liz's points, I think they're really, really important because, um, you know, so often uh, the rise in self-employment is presented as something that has been uniformly positive for women because so many more women have become self-employed. But actually, when you look at their incomes, they are really low. And that, again, unsurprisingly, is intersectional. So you find that when you've then got you know, Black, Asian and minority ethnic women, that they will tend to be um, on even lower incomes and so on and so forth, just as we would expect, unfortunately, um, given inequality. So what do we need to do? Well, a huge amount. Um, as Liz knows, you know, I, I repeatedly and, and Rachel's continue to do this with calling for all the measures that government introduces around COVID related support or any other form of business related policy to actually be impact assessed. You know, as I said before, you know, obviously that comes at the end rather than the beginning, but they're not even doing that. So they did not capture the fact that many of those problems with, for example, a self-employed income support scheme were landing on the shoulders of often women and, uh, and that was causing them huge problems. Um, uh, but then we also need to make sure that we're actually the party that wants to represent the self-employed. And I certainly do. It's really important to me. I think we need to recognise the energy and value of self-employment. I think we need to recognise it as actually a motor of social mobility and how important it has been. And I think that's particularly important actually for uh, different groups with protected characteristics where very often self-employment can be a route into, uh, uh, into more secure um, uh, financial circumstances and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, under Conservative government, so often that isn't happening. So a huge amount for us to do. And I would start with security. I think the security for people, as I, and we've had this discussion a lot, Liz, um, because of the work that you do, is just lacking far too often. And we need to be the party that says we won't tolerate that anymore. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and I'll just be very, very quick because we have to we have to end uh, now. Thank you very much, everybody that's joined online. Uh, apologies that if I haven't come to you, um, I just want to obviously uh, the Fabians Women's Network is a network of fabulous women, uh, all really trying to address structural inequality and support each other. Uh, if you are if you're if you're not aware of us, please go online. We'd love you to join. We're open as the gentleman at the back talked about allyship please also uh look into supporting us we we, we are desperate i'm not i'm not i'm not ashamed to ask for money so please support us with contributions whether or not it's a price of a coffee or anything more that you can spare um it helps us to support women uh um uh, intersectional uh across the country all ages all backgrounds uh, to have a voice and to have a meaningful contribution to society. Um, and, and finally, uh, we have a mentorship program and the um, applications are open until the 6th of February. And I would really love that every woman here that hasn't been through the program absolutely applies. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Thank you. <laughs>